Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Hello and welcome to this episode of our program. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle. Today we have with us Jennifer Maloka, founder of Woohoo Coaching. Welcome to the program, Jennifer. Thank you, Mike. I'm very excited to be a guest on your show today. Hey, happy to have you. And uh, just bring us up to speed on a little bit about your background and um, what in the world a woohoo coach is and does. <laughs> well, first <laughs> and fun. foremost, it's really fun to say woohoo. And, yeah. And um, I am a certified coach. I partner with horses to facilitate emotional healing and provide guidance for people who don't know what the heck their their goals and objectives are. They are um, they they're they're being held back from past from things in their past, and I just help to provide them a safe space for which they can really discover who they are and what they want out of life, so that they can start enjoying the a life that they absolutely love living. And I have. A degree, I have a degree in fitness, which led me to getting certified as a wellness coach, which led me to um, doing my training in Gestalt psychology. I'm not a therapist, nor do I play one on TV. However, I've had over 400 hours of training in Gestalt to partner with the horses. And I'm sure that you and your most of your audience has heard of the Horse Whisperer, the book and the movie, and all of my uh, horsemanship training has been with Buck Brandman, who is the man, the real life man who the story was based on. Oh, neat! And so I take that that training and the Gestalt training and the the co- the wellness coaching certification, so that I can really listen deeply to what my clients need. And my goal is to have the best possible questions I can ask of them because. At the end of the day, we are our own best experts. We are the world's foremost authority on ourselves. We just might not always have the right questions to ask of ourselves, and that's where I step in for my clients. Yeah, because, you know, it's kind of like you can't see the forest for the trees. You're too close. Well, maybe people are too close to themselves to even realize intricacies or angles or insights or, like you said, questions. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's it's really fascinating to me the the when people are running up against roadblocks, they keep running into either self-sabotage or finding themselves in unhealthy relationships, or they just can't seem to get to the next level in their business or their careers, it's usually due to an operating system that's humming along in the background that we really have no knowledge of that was created when we were really small. And it's that's, part of the work I do is helping people identify those operating systems that no longer serve so that we can uninstall them to reinstall an operating system that does. Yeah, because it's kind of like you can't build on a faulty foundation because it'll just crumble again. Exactly, exactly. And it's it's fascinating because when we are small, and I'm going to just take a, a different Um, Okay, so one of my clients is a very, very successful sales coach. He worked in um, corporate sales, making six figures for many years, and then started his own business. During the conversation that we had, we just started to talk, and he talked about two different events in his life. One was at the age of three, and one was at the age of 15, and he shared with me, I never talked about, I, I thought that I had made peace with that. I thought that that was in the past, but now talking with you, I realize this actually is, is putting up roadblocks from me achieving what my goals and objectives. Hmm. And it was, it was fascinating because I, I hear that a lot with people that, wow, I thought I'd process that. And talk therapy is fantastic and definitely has its place. When I partner with, well, when I work with clients and I'm partnering with the horses, Mike, it's really fascinating because horses are living, breathing BS meters, and you have not been called out until you've been called out by a 1,200-pound mute. Hmm. Well, 
and, and give me an example of what is called out. What, is, what, what, oh, what would okay. that look like? Okay, so have you ever met someone? Oh, I'll, do, I'll, I'll say it like this. So when people have maybe a gap in their self-esteem and self-worth, we can, we've heard over and over and over, fake it till you make it, fake it till you make it. And, and there is power in that, and that is accurate. However, if the operating system that we're humming, that's coming along in the background is directly opposed to that statement, then we can, we can stand and declare, yes, I am worthy. Yes, I deserve to achieve my goals. And what happens, the, the horses really love it when we are fully present in our bodies, not just what I call floating heads, because we are brilliant. We are brilliant. We can think our way out. We can dream of things and think our way out of things and explain all sorts of things. But it's not until we tap into the brilliance of our bodies that there's a lot of information stored within our bodies. And when we connect our heart and our mind, we are able to have a direct connect to God, to source, to the divine, whatever you happen to call it. And that's where we stand in our brilliance. Well, when we're, stand, when we're in our head and we say, I declare that I am worthy, if our, if, if our core belief doesn't match that, then there's dissidence, there's a disconnect. Well, the horses, when we are fully in our bodies feeling our emotions, they literally, it's, it's almost if you can have a picture of someone leaning towards you, listening and hanging on your every word. When we're in our heads, they can't be bothered. They just they have no interest. And so because they in, in effect they almost can tell you don't have any interest because you're not all in. Exactly. Not only and we might feel like we're all in. That's the thing. We might feel yeah. like we're all in, but at the end of the day, if there's if we don't a hundred percent believe in it, then it doesn't matter how much we fake it. We're never going to get there. And so when I say you haven't been called out, it's I've had clients who have been in the round pen with the horse declaring, I am worthy, and the horse is over eating grass. Yeah. And as soon as they drop in to their feel, as soon as they release that, that underlying roadblock and they really feel into it, I am worthy, the horse instantly comes over and, and nuzzles the person. Hmm. So it's fascinating. Uh, there's one one um, I work with uh, teams a lot. I, whether it's in a corporate setting and it's a team that's trying to achieve a goal, but they're having problems or direct sales, I work with those those teams as well. Because when you have a group of people and they're all trying to go the same way, but they aren't actually working as a team, it's really challenging to achieve your goals and objectives when every member of the team isn't playing their role full out and, and they aren't communicating clearly and object, uh, clearly and um, they aren't communicating clearly and effectively. So yeah. one of the exercises that I have is silent leading. So the horse is, everybody's surrounding the horse and the horse has a halter on with a lead line and the person who's in charge of leading has the, the, lead, the, the horses on the right side of the person and the lead line is in the left hand. The goal is you can't make the horse move. You have to feel into yourself, into your leadership, and just know when you start walking, the horse is going to follow you. Huh. If there's even one iota of doubt, that horse is not going to move. And at 1,200 pounds, it's, it's really pretty much impossible for us humans to make a 1,200-pound animal move. With yeah, you can push you, all you want. Just, right, exactly, exactly. It, and it's fascinating because the horses actually help me teach boundaries as well. So let's say, and this is one thing I really find a lot in women in particular, is that women don't generally don't have a boundary until they've been pushed past the breaking point and then they lash out in anger. And the only way for them to have a boundary is if they get angry. And it's super common. So with a horse, you, you know, you can yell at the horse, you can try to push the horse all you want, but it's not going to move. So what I do is I help my clients learn how to have a healthy boundary 
without anger and how to enforce it. And again, just centering into ourselves, connecting our heart and our minds, our body, and really feeling grounded, we're then able to not to to, to have the request of a boundary and enforce it from an adult energy as opposed to a child energy. And I'm not saying that the women are being childish. That's far, far, far from what I'm saying. But the, the hope, gee, I hope that they will listen versus you will listen. Mm-hmm. You, you will move your feet. And, and I'm not going to move my feet. You will move your feet. With horses, they're herd animals. They don't want to be the leader. They, they really don't. And you don't want a 1,200-pound scaredy cat being the leader. So if, they, if the horse moves my feet, if the horse walks into me and I move my feet, the horses, in effect, become the leader. And, again, that's not something you want. You want to be able to stand in your power, step into the horse, and have the horse move away. And part of that is just just knowing in your heart of hearts, I'm going to move towards you, and you're going to move away. There's no anger. It's just the fact. I don't know if you're old enough to remember Dragnet and Detective Friday, but just the facts. You're, mm-hmm. you're going to move. Just the mm-hmm. facts. There's no anger. There's no emotion. Just, just move your feet. Does that make sense? It, it does, and you know, it's it's kind of like, um, it reminds me of the concept that people respond in kind, and it, uh, what I mean is, you've probably heard this played out, but when you start, you get an argument, and then your voice is raised, then the other person's voice is raised, and then the other voice is raised, and then all of a sudden it's a shouting match. Well, in reality, if you bring yours down, it's like, listen here's what I mean. All of a sudden, it changes that dynamic. And very, very many times, I think that that's how that, that leadership style you're describing would work is you have to start with being the leader. You know, you need to be within yourself before people recognize it. It's like the, they say in the airplanes, you know, take care of yourself, put the oxygen on yourself before you help your child. And it, you fight against that going, my kid, I need, but if you're not around, if you can't breathe, you can't help them, and now you're both in trouble. So I think knowing yourself and knowing that leadership style and knowing how to tap into that is so huge, and it's just so very unique that you are able to do that with horses because from a competitive advantage standpoint, I'm sure that in your practice you have a lot of competitors, but um, if you were to hear 10 or 15 of your competitors pitch someone on why they should choose them and you walk in and you're, you're going to be uh, able to stand out because of all the same clinical um, wonderful things you do, but if you can do this in a very unique way, it becomes an experience. Exactly. Exactly. Exactly, and I love, I love, 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 love that you tapped into be the leader that you need to be. And when, <laughs> when I first got my horse, he was my first horse. I'd never had, uh, I'd never leased a horse. I'd never owned a horse. I, I really didn't have any experience with horses. And I got an off-the-track thoroughbred who raced for almost 10 years, which is, it, it's insane. Most race horses only race for maybe a couple of years and have maybe 20 starts. There's a term in the um, racehorse industry for horses that have had over 50 starts, and that's called war horse. Mm-hmm. My ex racehorse had 102 starts, and uh, and he finished every start. Good night. He was still it, it, it's it's and he he's when he came off the track, he, I ended up he ended up going into a rescue because he was overly aggressive, and and I didn't I honest I I had heard that. And I thought, but, you know, I, I'm all about being of service. I'm all about, you know, my, all my animals are rescues. So I met my, I met my horse to be, and I knew in, intuitively, instinctively, I, I had, he was my horse. I knew he didn't really know anything, but I knew he was kind. And you can't train kind, but you can train everything else. So I'd had him for a couple of years and working with Buck Brandeman and I, you know, at that point he, he was a professional athlete and, and with any professional athlete, there is a toll on their bodies. So he's, he's a little less arthritic. And at the time he had, um, I was, I was really his last stop. And in order for me to save his life, I had to become the leader he needed me to be to save his life. Mm. Because at the end of the day, no one really wants a 13-year-old 
ex-athlete with arthritis with an attitude problem. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, it's just, that's just the reality. And so I, I had to dig deep within myself to really step up. And the irony, which is not lost on me, is the leader that I needed to be to save his life ended up being the leader I needed to be to save my own. Hmm. I needed to learn how to have so that, a healthy That's the true win win. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I had to learn how to have, I had to learn what a healthy boundary was, how to have a healthy boundary without anger, how to lead with heart and soul, how to, you know, in, in the horse, in Buck Brandman's training style, is you want to be able to do as little as possible to get the result you want while being willing to follow up the request with as much as you need to do to have the horse do what you're asking, right? But, but, so, you know what, that right there reminds me, and, and this might be, um, it, it just, it just it's very interesting. What you just described makes me think of, in the business world, minimum viable product and pivot, meaning get something started and out there, not perfect, do the minimum viable product to get it out to market, to start to see what the reaction is. And if there needs to be tweaks or changes, you pivot a little. You don't scrap it and throw it away. You pivot and continue moving forward just in that little slight new uh, direction. Well, that kind of what you just described from a personality leadership uh, standpoint has applications in so many things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's that, (laughs) yes, it's, it's breathtaking. All these, these lessons that I've learned partnering with my horse has has directly apply to so many different areas in life. Um, It's the, and, and from a leadership perspective, let's just go to a leadership perspective Let's say, because I know your listeners are small business owners, uh, solopreneurs, and there's probably others as well. And at the end of the day, when you're talking about leadership, it's super important to lead by example and not not be perfect, right? Mm -hmm. And I always want to surround myself with people who are as smart, if not preferably smarter, right? And not saying that my horse is smarter in some ways he is definitely, but, um, but from a leadership perspective, when, if you look at it from, I, I, because of my, my background in fitness, I'm a huge sports person. So if you look at it, I'm going to say football from a football perspective, you have the head coach, right? And so this is, this is in the organization, whatever your organization is, whether it's direct sales or you have employees or you just are a solopreneur, you are the head coach mm-hmm. as the owner. And from a football perspective, there, you know that the team is made up of special teams and different coaches to head up those special teams, right? Well, when you have people in the correct position, playing the correct position, and you let them thrive and you cheer them on, and you're leading from that perspective, and you think of the the players are the team on the field, and your clients are the fans up in the stands. You're all cheering and playing towards a common goal and objective, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And and I'm sorry, God, I I get all excited because I start to see the the plays playing out on the field. (laughs) So... (laughs) You know, the whole goal is to, to run the ball down the field and, and win the game. And you put but the coach the isn't going to jump out there in the field and grab the ball. He's encouraging and motivating and coaching the actual, you know, field generals to go out there and do that. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so it's really important to have a clearly defined vision for where you want to be. Obviously, for football, it's winning the Super Bowl, right? Mm-hmm. Go Broncos. So, 
<laughs> well, you know, as I as, know you as like Seahawks, the Seahawks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> May the best team win. That's right? right. But we we're aligned on one point. The goal is winning, and coaches have to coach and and. And, and guess what? Um, you know, I'm sure you uh, have heard many times this kind of analogy. You know, boy, that that team m- mate or that quarterback is such a leader in the locker room. You you yeah. hear that phrase a lot. Well, the yeah. coach the coach is sitting back there, kind of smiling because he's coached and encouraged that leader to be the leader to his teammates. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And what else has he done? That head coach has empowered his general on the field to do what needs to be done on the field, right? Yeah. So the the head coach is not micromanaging his star quarterback. Yeah. He tra- he's developed his star quarterback and he trusts his star quarterback to do the job he needs to do to win the day. To rally the troops to do what he needs to do. So it's it, I love <laughs> I kind of love sports. And I love how sports tie directly into all aspects of life as well. Sure. Right? And oh, so, which leads us to being of service, right? The, a powerful leader is of service. And yeah. whether they're the leader, and again, being the leader you need to be, of anybody needs to be, to be the leader for their own life, to really ex- experience true success. And, and it's like that, for, um, that term know. servant leadership. You know, a lot of times you're not going to respond in full to the leading until you see that leader rolling up their sleeves and digging in and getting dirty right along with you. Exactly. Exactly. And what I love about being of service, and there's so many different ways to be of service. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, though, um, when we, well, it, there's so many different ways to be of service. I'll, I'll stay there and then I'll go in the direction of when I truly, truly connect with other people, and it doesn't even matter where I am, in what context, whether it's a networking, a sales conversation, or just being at a, a social event. And when I'm able to truly be of service and just listen, so Mike, you and I could be having a conversation in and when I get truly authentically interested in you and what you're doing, what your goals and objectives are, and then I think to myself and I really feel into it, how can I be of service to you? It might be simply listening. You know, so many people aren't heard. They don't feel heard because they aren't listened to because so many people are just waiting for their turn to talk. Mm-hmm. And, but when we are able to just really sit and listen, to be present with someone and what they're talking about, what their needs are, what their goals and objectives are, listening is such a tremendous gift. It's so, truly being of service. But then the next step is, hmm, who do I know that this person needs to be introduced to to help them with their goals and objectives? Do I know anybody? Can I connect them? Or at the very least, at least now I'm listening to, to when other people talk, and if I hear the key phrase of what that person I was talking to needs, I can say, oh, hey, I just met someone who is in need of what it is you're looking for. And it may be our service. When we're talking to the person, it actually may be our service, but then again, it might not be. Mm-hmm. But when we truly have a heart of service, we're, we have a, tr- a heart of contribution. And so what I, how I look at the world is there's the law of attraction. When I have a clear view of what it is I want, what's my goal, of the, you know, the whole the winning the Super Duper Bowl, the Super Bowl. So that's my goal and objective. That's, that's what I want to attract. Being of service is engaging the law of contribution. When I fully engage the law of contribution and I am truly of service, I can't help but create an army of advocates which at the end of the day will help me achieve and and realize the law of abundance. Mm -hmm. So there's three, three laws, universal laws that come into place when we are truly of service. When I do a discovery call with a client to, to see, can I, be, can I help this client? 
what is it that, that they, is their need? And if I can be of service, then it is my responsibility to get myself out of the way, get my fear out of the way so that I can really truly be of service. So as an example, let's say you and I are having a conversation and you share with me something that I know in my heart of hearts I can help you with. I just, I know it. If I if I don't overcome your objectives, which is your fear most of the time, then I'm not being of service to you. Mm-hmm. If, if your objective or ob- objection is, say, money, then if, I, I, if, if my fear, if my ego is in the way of me being able to provide you the service that really, truly, I know can help you get where you want to go, and you throw out the, well, that sounds really great, but I just don't have the money, if I just simply allow my fear to take over, I'll say, oh, well, okay, well, let me know when you have the money, then, you know, maybe I can be of service. Versus, so tell me, what is the cost of you staying where you are? Yeah, you know, how much taking is it going to cost you? Right. Yeah, that's right. the opportunity cost. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But I need to get out of my, I need to get over my fear. I need to get out of my way because if I'm withholding something from a client that I know will change their life for the better, how selfish of me to, to prevent them from being able to work with me. And, and then you move to the win-win like we were talking about earlier, and it doesn't feel like you got them, sold them, closed them. It feels like we worked on this together, we overcame this concern of yours, and now let's roll up our sleeves together and get to work. I think that, that, that approach is so uh, uh, comfortable. So here's a question for you in, in wrapping up. This is such a unique approach to leadership and leadership coaching and leadership training that I'm sure most people just don't hear these types of things, especially with the uh, uh, horse approach. So how can someone learn more and what would the next step be? to engage with you and learn more? They can go to my website. That's woohoocoaching.com, W-U-H-O-O-C-O-A-C-H-I-N-G.com. They can find me on Facebook, Woohoo Coaching on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. And for your listeners, anyone who wants to schedule a 30-minute complimentary consultation with me, to just to have a, it's a, just a discovery conversation to see if working with me is a good fit. And they can reach out to me with an email, jennifer at woohoocoaching.com, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R at woohoocoaching.com, or call me, 206-601-2485. And I am in the Seattle area. However, I have partnered with horses in various locations across the U.S., including the East Coast, um, um, Virginia, California, Colorado, Arizona, and even up in Canada. So I do travel to do trainings. That is awesome. And I just think it's such a neat business model. So it's wonderful getting to know you and hearing about your interesting business. Thank you for your time. And we'll definitely put your contact information in our show notes. And um, wish you all the best. And thanks again for your time on the interview today, Jennifer. Mike, thank you so much. It was a great conversation. I really enjoyed talking with you today. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.